Oh, God, good, you're here. I am so excited. Guess what? Uh, I hope this isn't about your podcast again. Why? Did you finally listen to it? Da 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 The Gloomy Next Door Production. You're listening to BYOTP Radio. Coming up next, the Gloomy Next Door. Okay. Hello, pups and kittens, and welcome to a Thanksgiving stuffed edition of The Groomer Next Door. I'm your host, Chris Green, and joining us in just a few moments is Jessica Slater. Jessica is one of the top attorneys in the United States, and currently, she is handling two of the biggest pet cases in the legal realm. And we will get into all of that in just a few moments. But before we do that, let's get into the fact of the week. In ancient times, lawyers were not legal experts at all. They were orators. They wrote and performed rousing speeches on behalf of people being tried for crimes and would sometimes serve as witnesses. Over time, the role of orator became an inextricable part of the court's process evolving from performance to specific legal profession. Interesting. Did not know that. Well, I'm hoping that all of you guys who did get to travel for this Thanksgiving Day fiasco, I guess you could call it, because it's so crazy when whether you're on the road or you're in the air. I hope that you all made it home safely, or as you might be traveling as you're listening to this podcast, I hope you all have a safe travel and all make it home very safe and are able to cuddle up with your pets. Well, by that sound, Jessica is about to make her way into the podcast studio. So, with that said, please welcome Jessica Slater. Oh, hello. Hold on a sec. Dad, we have a guest on the podcast. This week on the podcast, we are joined by a super, super attorney. And I mean, I'm not talking about the little Judge Judy type super attorney. I'm talking about the mega star out there. And I'm dying to know all about you. But this week, we are joined by Jessica Slater. She is, uh, let's just say, the superstar of all attorneys out there. And I am just so excited to be able to sit down and talk to you. So thank you for being on. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That's quite an introduction. <laughs> Thank I, you for the compliment. I feel like I, I, I didn't do it justice. I feel like there's still so much more that I need to be saying. You are attached to so many great cases, and we're going to get to them. But before we actually do, I have to actually congratulate you on getting married. You got married in August. Thank you. I've, yes, I did. I definitely you know make sure to do my research beforehand. So congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. That's always an exciting moment. That's got to be, you know, one of the most scariest things you do in life. <laughs> well, hopefully not. <laughs> it, I hope you're not like me. I got married in Vegas, and I made sure to drink a little bit more because I was afraid of standing up there at the altar. Um, not because I chose wrong, just because I was just scared to death. And I don't think <laughs> anything scares you. By, the, by your bio, I can't imagine anything does. Yeah, it certainly wasn't as scary as being in court. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> well, you know what? Let's go all the way back. I want to know your origin story, where you grew up, how you became who you are. How did it all begin for Jessica Slater? <laughs> well, I guess in a nutshell, I'm originally from the Midwest, um, St. Louis, and I guess I always thought, like, I kind of wanted to, you know, go big. So by the time I graduated from law school uh, in St. Louis, I started applying to jobs all across the country. And I had actually done um, some internships in D.C. with the federal government. And uh, my first job ended up being at the Missouri Attorney General's office, which is in Jeff City, Missouri, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys are real familiar with. Oh, yeah. But 
after being there for a little bit, I was able to, you know, transition myself to a job in New York City. And I originally started working for the subway system, which is kind of random. (laughs) And I sort of realized that I wasn't really uh, the type to kind of be uh, tied down by all the red tape. And so I decided I wanted to go into civil litigation. And I ended up at a firm that was doing class action work. And until you kind of get into class actions, you don't really learn about it in law school. (laughs) But it was right when the mortgage crisis happened. And so we were in every single case against every single Wall Street Bank. (laughs) And that kind of kicked off my career. You know, it was super exciting, you know, and uh, I kind of went from suing a city mortgage relating to um, the mortgage, the subprime mortgage uh, crisis and helping homeowners to going into more of like consumer law relating to false advertising. And after many years of practicing at a big uh, national class action law firm in New York City, I decided to start my own firm uh, doing class actions about three years ago now. So it's really nice being able to decide um, which cases I want to do and being the leader in those decisions. That You know what? That is just absolutely amazing. Now, you know what's funny is that I picked up one thing is that you're modest. You didn't even <laughs> even mention the fact that how you graduated. You were top of your class in in Saint in your actual college. I mean, that alone, you just completely just blew past it. That alone, <laughs> I'm like, you were top of your class. How do you not? How do you not mention that? That's the first that I'd be like, yep, I did that. Um, <sighs> well, thank you. I mean, it's, I guess my whole life I've always worked really hard. And I wouldn't say I'm someone who naturally has, you know, like really great grades or, you know, got the high score on the test or anything like that. But I've always been a really hard worker. And I think that's kind of what benefited me the most in what I do. And it makes a difference, you know, for bringing these types of cases. You know, I'm not scared of hard work. (laughs) And once we bring, you know, some of these really uh, thoroughly researched uh, and investigated cases, it makes a big difference, and that's how you succeed. You know, the other thing that I found funny was that you mentioned Jeff City. For anybody who is not in the Midwest, and especially Missouri, they're kind of wondering, where's Jeff City? Well, it's Jefferson City. <laughs> but for anybody who lives here, you never say Jefferson, you just say Jeff City. So yep. <laughs> I picked that one up, and I was like, oh, that was funny. So Sorry, there's just a couple things <laughs> I didn't that I never realize it. <laughs> I know, right? I do the same thing, and and I'm like, oh yeah. People will say, "Where's Jeff City?" I've never heard of it. Oh, uh, it's the capital, <laughs> or or the capital of Missouri is St. Louis. No, it's not. Um, but people still think that it is, which is weird. <laughs> yeah, it was a long, long time ago. But yeah, Jefferson City, <laughs> as you said, Chris, is right smack in the middle of Missouri and. Yeah. This country, I think, like if you drew a line across it. I don't even know. I mean, it's 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 country to get there. I I take uh, sixty three through um, through the whole thing that windy road. It's 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 dreadful, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a unpleasant drive and definitely not something you want to do during the winter. Um, but I thought that was funny, and and I would imagine <laughs> how how challenging it would be just to to be part of all of that. It's it's difficult. Yeah, um, it was a big transition going from there to uh, New York City, probably one of the biggest ones that's out there. <laughs> I oh, wasn't afraid of being the little fish in the big pond. So <laughs> I did the opposite. I thought I was going to be a big fish in a little pond. It doesn't work that way, though, which I, I no. <laughs> learned that the hard way. Yeah. Now, let's stay on the Missouri topic, because obviously there's a great deal of meat and potatoes with Missouri and pets. And Mm -hmm. you know all too well how it can be. Tell us, um, what is the lack of pet treatment and law just in the Midwest alone? Because we were talking about before we started recording, and you you had mentioned the 2011 change for the puppy mills and how a couple years later it was overturned. And I Mm -hmm. found that to be very interesting. I'm pretty sure you read a lot about it. What was your take on it? What's your take on it even to this time, to right now? Yeah, well, I mean, I can't um, 
speak to it the way I would have done about 10 years ago when I still lived there, but I've still followed a lot of the changes. And I guess that also leads me to uh, one of our current cases, which is against Petland. Mm-hmm. And a, like all of, well, I shouldn't say all, many of the animals that are sold in retail stores come from Puppy Mills in Missouri. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the number one producers in this entire country, which is rather shocking because it's not something that you see, you know, with your eyes unless Mm -hmm. you're kind of involved in it. And that was part of the reason that there was this referendum in 2011 that you mentioned that voters in majority vote decided that they wanted to improve the conditions at these puppy mills, which effectively may have put the puppy mills out of business because Mm -hmm. it would no longer be profitable if they had to give the animals better conditions to live in and make them healthy. (laughs) And unfortunately, as you mentioned, several years later, well, not even several, a couple years later, (laughs) the Missouri legislature actually overturned Mm -hmm. the voters' wishes and, you know, did away with that you know, improvement to those uh, businesses. And, you know, it's always sad, you know, the animals don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And it takes, you know, people like you to give that to them, you know. And, you know, it's part of the reason we have to do it. I mean, it's it's the same with children, you know, Mm -hmm. that, (laughs) you know, there's there's just no one to fight for them, you know, that so they can be heard. And, And that's why, like, I think so much of this, terrible stuff goes on, you know, whether it's the pet food industry or the live animal industry, whatever it is, factory farming (laughs) can go on and on. But because they don't have their own voice to fight back, you know, this this is all we can do. And it's so bizarre to me. I mean, you know, I always look at what's going on with pets and I relate to two different times that are really kind of close together. And that was, Let's go back to the 70s and 80s when child law changed, when there was actual child abuse and the actual states would get involved. And then I take the next thing and I go, and then, of course, big tobacco. And Mm -hmm. I put the Mm -hmm. two together and I say, that's the exact time that we're in right now. We have these these little creatures that are of the mindset of a three to four year old. They they mm-hmm. know everything that's around them. They feel pain. They feel everything. They feel love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But just like a four-year-old would. But they don't have the voice. Just like a three-year-old doesn't yeah. have a voice. And then mm-hmm. they're being mm-hmm. fed big tobacco, you know, in quotation, mm-hmm. type product. Mm-hmm. And it's it's up to us to actually say, hey, look, you're responsible. Mm-hmm. And then there's people Absolutely. like you who are actually doing it which is the amazing part and that's where my next part is is and i've always wanted to ask this question so i'm so glad i get to ask you why is the big kibble companies allowed to falsely advertise their products well <laughs> that's a, a very <laughs> um loaded type question <laughs> Yay! For good reason <laughs> no but for good reason and i think that your comparison to the tobacco is a a really good example because before the Surgeon General's warning was put onto cigarettes, Mm -hmm. everyone was smoking them. You Mm -hmm. know, ignorance is bliss, right? Yep. And it actually took, and it was the former firm before I started my own firm that I worked at, Milberg, that brought the first false advertising case against the cigarette companies. Wow. And because of that case, that's what led the government to step up and actually say, oh, this is bad. Let's study this and let's put this warning on there so people actually know it's bad. <laughs> and actually, I, this is unrelated, but I just recently did an e-cigarette case. And that's yeah. industry, the same is facing the same problems. But to go to what you asked about the pet food, one of the biggest issues um, that a lot of people have identified um, that are, you know, consumer advocates is that right now the FDA is supposed to be regulating pet food as well as the FTC, you know, for the false advertising part of it. 
the mm-hmm. FDA is supposed to be regulating the label, you know, so whatever is on the product. But the FDA doesn't want to touch, you know, extra advertising. So, like, if there's a commercial or, um, you know, their website, anything like that. And the law, the federal law that regulates this, the Food and Drug Cosmetics Act, defines pet food as food, the same mm-hmm. as people food. Mm-hmm. So under that definition, it can't be adulterated, which means that it can't be from an animal that has not died by slaughter. It can't contain a poisonous substance. It can't be contaminated, you know, by unsanitary conditions, anything like that. So where the disconnect is in the pet food industry, because there's no um, external proactive regulation of these companies, they are actually providing adulterated meat. Mm-hmm. So it's not human grade meat. So unless the actual product itself says on it that it's human grade, which some some pet food companies actually are human grade, and they say that on their label, it's not. <laughs> and in the state laws, many state laws say that that's okay, mm-hmm. that you can actually provide this adulterated meat to use only in pet foods. So even though it wouldn't be allowed under the federal law, they are allowing it. <laughs> So it's it's a very weird uh, disconnect, you know, between the state laws and the federal laws and what food means. Mm-hmm. So most pet food is actually feed. Mm-hmm. I was waiting for it. I was going to, if you didn't <laughs> say it, I was going to jump right in and go, okay, now I know what you're alluding to. And I would love for that text to be drawn into it. So go for it. Yeah. And so, I mean, One of, like, the big problems, you know, is that we've found out um, in the one case where I'm representing the plaintiffs and uh, the representative class Mm -hmm. against Evengers Mm -hmm. that the meat that they used in their pet foods that they were advertising as human grade and USDA inspected was actually contaminated with pentobarbital, which Mm -hmm. is... uh, drug used to euthanize animals and in human executions. Mm -hmm. And that indicates that it's from animals that did not die by slaughter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's the basis for the class action that we're currently litigating. Oh, and we're going to be going into that one in just a boat in just a moment. Um, Cause I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm in absolute awe by both Petland and Avengers, but, um, you know when you're when you're talking about the definition between pet food and pet feed, yeah, mm-hmm. obviously that's that's got Susan Thixton's name all over that. And I was waiting, <laughs> I was waiting for the the word Susan Thixton to come out. Um, <laughs> now we all we all know that she has petitioned for them to actually change the labels for these mm-hmm. inadequate, if if that's even the right term. I mean, it's probably so much worse than inadequate but for these companies to actually change the term pet food to pet feed Mm -hmm. of course it's not going to happen and and they say that it was going to happen they were going to start making this work and of course they lied to her um what is your take on that and what kind of grounds do pet consumers or i don't even like to use the word pet consumers i'll take that one back um pet parents what kind of role do we have to force this? Or do we even have any? I mean, what I've kind of, I guess, observed with everything that kind of has to do with the pet food industry is that it's a very complicated situation. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned, the federal law says one thing and the state law says something else. Mm-hmm. And technically, the state laws are in conflict with what the federal law says. <laughs> So, you know, as a lawyer, when you have a federal, when you have a situation like that, the federal law preempts the state laws, but it's, it's just, it's a very difficult kind of situation, I think, because even if they were labeled as feed and food, a lot of people wouldn't even understand that, (laughs) you know, and I think that one of the biggest things that people can do And that's where someone like Susan is actually making such a huge difference is to educate. Mm -hmm. And the more you know, 
the more you can fight to change it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the greatest things that you can do, Chris. And you're also doing that through this podcast. I'm trying. The the more (laughs) pressure and buying power, you know, where people don't want to buy these foods, you know, that are potentially adulterated or feed, um, that will make a difference. You know, and it's like any other kind of uh, products that are out there. You know, people didn't want to buy GMO, so they started Mm -hmm. buying organic. You know, like there's all kinds of uh, consumer buying power that can just make a huge difference, I think. And that, I think, will have more of an impact than any kind of fight that we can have because you know (laughs) that obviously the pet food industry is a very powerful and – Money talks. <laughs> and unfortunately, I feel like even if we were to fight, you know, and say like this is, you know, inaccurate and everything else, that they would somehow change the law <laughs> and it wouldn't make a difference. <laughs> and there would be the next fight, you know. So it would just kind of be an ongoing battle. I don't think that there's ever not going to be an ongoing battle. I, you know, okay, again, <laughs> you know, it's just it's just part of life. But, mm-hmm. you know, again, you can go back to tobacco, then e-cigarettes, as you were mentioning. Mm-hmm. I, I did actually see that one, and I thought that was really cool. Um, again, you're so versatile. You're in so many different realms that I, I don't even know how you can keep them all straight. I mean, that's that's just <laughs> that alone. I was reading them, and I'm like, nothing, nothing really is the same. I mean, you must have to read constantly to stay on top of all this. I mean, it's it's crazy, but... You know, when I look at, at this situation and I, I, I see something as deadly as kibble. And, mm-hmm. and I think to myself, you know, the strange part to me is that there's not enough, there's not a lot of wrongful death being mm-hmm. put on these pet food companies. And I find that mm-hmm. to be, it's, it's so strange. And we were even talking about before we started about, you know, how do you compensate because we treat animals as property. Mhm, mhm. But that yeah. I know that's actually for me the biggest difference between doing a human product versus doing these pet products. And I really wish that this wasn't the pattern that I'm seeing, but mm. when you're talking about these human products, you're talking about people that are paying a premium for a product that's falsely advertised one way. And when you're talking about these pet food products, you're saying the same thing, but then someone's dog died or almost died because of this mistake, you know, this misrepresentation. Right. And, you know, that that is the biggest difference for me, you know, with the different types of cases. Um, and it's really sad, you know, that that's what we're facing. But, you know, it, it, it's the next big one, I think, you know, because there's so many people in this country and across the world, really, um, that have pets that treat them as members of their family. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that this is exposing it. And, you know, when you have a project product like Avengers or some of these other ones that are kind of coming out, these are people that are trying to buy the better products. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not buying the Walmart brand dog food. They're buying the expensive one and they're learning that this is the same as the cheap product. And, I mean, there's a market for these cheap products, you know. I mean, people still buy cigarettes, you know, like whatever, you know, uh, drink alcohol. Like, if you know what it is and you decide to make that choice, that's fine. But if you're lied to about what it is and you don't think it has these health risks associated with it because it's supposed to be human grade, and then your dog dies, that's a different story. You know, it's it's funny because the, the comparison to big tobacco and pet kibble, it, it's it fits perfect. You know, mm-hmm. I've looked back and I think we're about the same age. And I remember you could go into a restaurant and there used to be, and I don't, I, again, I didn't grow up in Missouri, but I'm pretty sure it was mm-hmm. the same thing. They would have cigarette machines, those, mm-hmm. and you could just, you, it was right next to the bathroom. It was so accessible mm-hmm. to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I and, remember in college going to uh, bars and losing my voice at the end of the night because it was so smoky. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. You know, I didn't even think about the fact that there was that whole smoking, non-smoking sections, and you might have been mm-hmm. in non-smoking, but it was still smoky over there. Very strange. I didn't even think about that. Wow. And, you know, there's the comparison to, and and I'm not even going to lump one product in. 
it pretty much you can go down your big box store and anything mm-hmm. that's in the kibble is bad. There's really mm-hmm. not, there's nothing good there. And you know what? The price difference is the only thing that changes. That's it. And it shocks mm-hmm. me. Now, I always ask everybody this question, and I'm going to ask you this question as well, because now that your aha moment came on and you know what's in, in kibble, Mm -hmm. Do you ever have a soapbox moment? Mine is typically to start a conversation with somebody who has any kind of kibble in their uh, baskets. Do you ever Mm -hmm. find yourself having that conversation? Oh, all the time. (laughs) It's more that I tell the facts of what happened to the mouths, Uh you know, that are the plaintiffs in the Avengers class action. You tell that story to anyone. You know, I mean, even people that don't have pets and they are shocked that this exists, that this can go on in this country. <laughs> and yeah, it I mean, does. That's, it, it's, it's good to be able to tell that story. I wish we didn't, you know, I wish we didn't have that story to tell, but it almost takes something like that to really shake people up and to realize how bad it is. Now, you know, I want to make, I, I've been kind of burying the lead, obviously, with the whole Avengers kind of case. Um, so, you know what? I'm dying to actually dive into it, and I, I thought I could hold on a little bit longer before I actually, you know, would want to, you know, dive into this one. But let's go into this. Tell the story on how it all became um, out there, and now your role on representing the actual pet parents. Mm-hmm. Well, as you know, have you guys covered this on other uh, podcasts yeah. with anyone? Okay. Uh, no, well, not with anybody else. I think we did a story about it, I think, okay. early on. Well, I guess just to give like a brief kind of overview, uh, on December 31st of 2016, the Mouths, who are my plaintiffs, they went to a local independent pet store and wanted to treat their dogs for New Year's, um, you know, to a, a, you know, fun treat, basically. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to buy Avenger's hunk of beef. And they also bought the against the grain pulled beef. Mm -hmm. And when they got home and fed them to their dogs, one of their dogs, who was actually, you know, the leader of the pack, you know, the kind of dominant dog, uh, Tallulah, ate the most of it, of the hunk of beef. Okay. And the other dogs also ate some. And almost immediately, within like 15 minutes, they started acting intoxicated almost. And Nikki, who is the uh, plaintiff, she knew something was up right away. And she rushed them to a vet. And the vet was, you know, trying to figure out what, what it was, you know, what happened. And Tallulah later died. And the other dogs were all also treated. You know, they were severely disoriented. And after that, because it was clearly related to what they ate, the pet food, uh, the mouth had the intuition, which I, I don't think, you know, most, a lot of people don't think to do this because, you know, who would ever uh, think that it could be the pet food? But they had the intuition to get a necropsy done. And in the necropsy, where they is basically, you know, looking at the insides of their poor dog, Tallulah, um, they noticed, you know, something looked weird with, like, the stomach contents and stuff. And um, so they had taken, they had contacted, the FDA was involved at that point. And the FDA sent the stomach contents as well as the food to their lab to test it. And it all tested positive for pentobarbital, which, uh, as we mentioned before, is this drug that is used to euthanize animals. Mm -hmm. So that all happened in, like, the very beginning of January of this year. And because the FDA was involved, you know, everyone kind of thought, you know, something was going to happen with this and everything. And um, not until several months later did the mouse decide that they wanted to take legal action. And we brought the class action lawsuit in June of 2017. So that's the case that is on file right now. And in October 
um, we amended it and we added uh, several other places from different states who also had similar experiences with Avengers products. And, you know, I, I can tell you that I mentioned earlier that I worked on um, some of those subprime mortgage cases and you know how big of a story that was, you know, in yeah. the United States. But I've had more people contact me about Avengers than did about the subprime mortgage crisis. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's kind of the outcry uh, that's happened from this, you know, and it's people that all really care, you know, and they were trying to buy the better food. And so that's why they're so outraged, you know, by everything that's happened with this. You know, I, I found it to be, a, I, I, and I'm going to go back to the whole January thing. When when I started to read this and I started to, to follow the story, mm-hmm. I I believed at that time, I was still under this belief system, mm-hmm. kind of fairy tale, that the FDA, oh man, they're involved. This is going to get handled. They're going to do their job. And oh my God, they're going to get caught for this. Thank goodness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that that's not really the case well so as i mentioned the fda was actually involved from almost day one with this situation and obviously it's important to have a neutral third party you know that's a government entity involved you know i mean otherwise it's a she said he said you know kind of situation um that sometimes comes up but right we have the testing from the fda you know that was involved with this and they also went out and looked at Avengers facilities and they said that they were unsanitary and that the products that were made there were contaminated. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's more to this and, um, you know, they issued a warning letter. The FDA did in the end of June mm-hmm. of 2017. So, I mean, the it's still a fluid situation, um, you know, as far as, what the FDA may or may not do, I, I don't know. Right. Um, obviously, most of their uh, investigations, I think, are confidential. Um, clearly, we're going to be seeking discovery, <laughs> you know, in this uh, case relating to everything that's going on. So hopefully, you know, some of this will come to light, um, you know, and we'll figure out what was happening. But in the warning letter that was issued at the end of June, you had a lot of the same issues coming up. You know, the FDA, I think they said there's symptomatic uh, problems, you know, that are uh, throughout their facility. They couldn't pinpoint who the supplier was of the beef that went into the product. Right. They couldn't, Avengers couldn't confirm that the suppliers are not affiliated with any kind of raw materials that might have been contaminated with pentobarbital. So, you know, I mean, a lot of those same concerns are all there. And that was the end of June, you know. So, you know, we're in November now, but, you know, there hasn't been another warning letter. But that's usually kind of the last straw. You know, I I, I would, whenever we have a pet food recall, we'll do a, a little blip on the, on the podcast and we'll read it mm-hmm. verbatim. And, you know, again, though, I, I'm... I'm one of those cynical people. I don't think the FDA has done anything. And, you know, that's just, that's just an opinion to it. Um, I looked at, at this whole situation and I, I remember how they expanded their recall list and it was extensive and it was mm-hmm. all, it was all the same thing. And, and then there was this rumor that, um, some supplier had picked up dogs, cats, roadkill that had been euthanized and they were selling that i never did find out if that's actually true or not but the fact that it had pentobarbital in it that mm-hmm. is clear i mean what mm-hmm. the what and yeah it's shocking it's just shocking yeah. and i mean these other people um that are also plaintiffs in the litigation with the mouths they're from all over the country, and when their dogs ate those products, they had the same symptoms. So, I mean, it wasn't an isolated uh, situation, you know, as to the one can or anything like that. And as you mentioned, they went from saying, oh, it was only that one lot that was distributed to Washington, you know, where the mouths live. Mm-hmm. And then it went to like, oh, it's these other states. Oh, it's these other lots. Oh, it's this other product, <laughs> you know. Oh, it's a nationwide recall now. <laughs> 
it was kind of scary. I mean, it was like a tidal wave. And mm-hmm. and I was even surprised. And I would go on and I would do, oh, we have an actual update on it. And there's there's an extended uh, list. And it was it was it became this. Whoa, what is going on? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and yet here we go to the entire you know synopsis of all of this, and that is it it dog food, cat food, dog treats, even cat mm-hmm. treats. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's you know I'm I'm a raw feeder, and and mm-hmm. I always tell people, hey, you know what? I want to know one hundred percent my food is human grade. If I'm going to buy mm-hmm. it on the bag, mm-hmm. why not buy it in the store? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You'll save all of that hassle, but you have to have that aha moment. And unfortunately, yes. the mouth became an aha moment. And it, mm-hmm. it's so unfortunate to actually go down that that road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what goes in? Because here's where I love to pick your brain. And I love, and, and trust me, I could do this for years and I probably would still have things to ask, but what goes into preparation for something like this? Because it has to be extensive. Well, I mean, as far as, and and this is also, I think, very telling about the people who choose to stand up, you know, that either are the consumer advocates or that are the plaintiffs, you know, in the class action, whoever it is, but the people that really care they do a lot of the work for me. Like I mentioned with the mouths, like for whatever reason, they had the intuition to have this necropsy done. You know, people's, I hate to think how many people's animals might have died from the same thing, but they never would have known, you know, because they didn't go and have it tested. But I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest things that I think is very uh, different to a lot of other types of lawsuits is that it comes from people that really care and that they do a lot of the research, they do a lot of the testing, um, everything to try to seek justice. You know, I mean, that's the main thing. With regards to the pet food um, industry in general, you know, as as we were talking about, it's very complicated, (laughs) you know, as far as the different laws go and everything else. And, you know, it's something that I've been researching for years. So, fortunately, like when this came along, I knew the parts, you know, that kind of would apply to that. Like we were talking about with the adulterated and like, what does that mean? (laughs) You know, and the animals that have not died by slaughter, you know, and oh, that's linked to showing that it was euthanized. It didn't die by slaughter. So, you know, there's a lot of things that I guess I've, I've kind of had stored up, you know, for a while that helped us to do this. But, you know, a lot of it is just sitting down and going through the facts, you know, doing our legal research, you know, to make sure that everything is adequately put in there, you know, as to each claim, figuring out what we can plead, you know, as far as our legal claims go. Um, you know, with this one, as I mentioned, now we have people from all these different states. So not only do we have Washington claims and Illinois claims where Avengers is located, but we also have claims where all these other uh, plaintiffs are living. <laughs> different. I mean, I, I really could have done 50 different states, but <laughs> then the complaint would be a thousand page long. So <laughs> we tried to, you know, limit it somewhat. But that's that's kind of the major part that goes into this. It, it's so crazy. It is just so crazy. I I I cannot imagine in any world that food would be tainted and i'm always having the same mm-hmm. just just shock and mm-hmm. you don't you don't think it would happen and mm-hmm. then here mm-hmm. it is here it is and, and yeah. i'm i'm surprised that you're not getting more like i'm surprised people aren't saying you know what my dog did die from this and mm-hmm. I hear it all the time. How did you get there? Into are some. This? There are some that are coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> I believe that. So, so don't think they aren't there. They'll, they'll be coming. But, um, you know, I think, you know, like you mentioned, I think with this Avenger situation, it was like one of the biggest, kind of like you said, the aha moment for a lot of people, you know, not just like, you know, the directly involved people, but for a lot of pet parents you know, that are out there to realize that this could happen and it might have happened already, you know, but they never would have known because they, you know, didn't do the necropsy or have it tested. But I mean, there's, as you probably know, I mean, there was the chicken jerky 
mm-hmm. treats the issue where animals were dying, you know, all over the place and no one could ever pin it down as to what it was. And the closest that it, they ever came was, I think it was the New York um, Department of Agriculture did some testing and found some weird antibiotics or something, which, you know, contaminated it. But it's hard to say whether that was actually what led to all the animals getting sick and dying. But, you know, I mean, this a lot of this stuff is like a needle in the haystack. Yeah. And, you know, the, the menu foods recall several years ago, I mean, kind of a fluke thing that happened. And, I mean, they knew it was happening on the in the products that they were testing that those animals were getting sick. You know, I mean, that that all kind of came out, you know, that they're like, oh, something's wrong with this. But, you know, it's still on the market. Right. (laughs) You know, yeah, you never know with this stuff. And it's weird. Like, I mean, even uh, Avengers, like when they were trying to test it before, like they knew that it was the pentobarbital, like they weren't testing for pentobarbital. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, it's bizarre, but it's almost like sometimes you need to kind of figure out what this is, which is bizarre, but that's where we're at with the pet food. Well, it's such a foreign chemical. I mean, it wasn't like mm-hmm. something that you would have actually gone, oh, it's going to be... And who even knew the word pentobarbital unless you had mm-hmm. DVM at the end of your name or your Susan Fixton, yep, who is exactly. probably smarter than all, all that. But I didn't know what pentobarbital was at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I had to Google it. Absolutely. <laughs> yep, and then I'm like, oh, I know what that word is, um, and it's 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 become almost the key phrase in everything that's that's related to pets and pet food mm-hmm. is, pen, is does it have pentobarbital? It's like no, it has wort, yeah. it has wheat, corn, soy, gluten, but no pentobarbital, and and <laughs> you know it's it's as bad of of a joke as it is, it's almost kind of one of those things. It's like. Well, it might. I mean, it's got the wheat, yeah. it's got the corn. I mean, it shows it, it on the bag. Kind of neat, right? you know, like, yeah. Kind of neat. Like, that's the issue. And, but yeah. The FDA, I mean, years ago, they did a study because they were, uh, I think it was coming from the vets. And a lot of this, a lot of this background stuff is actually in our complaint because we thought it was important to demonstrate to the court how we got here, mm-hmm. you know, and it's based on all this, like, you know, different regulations and like that it's a self-regulated industry, which obviously doesn't work. (laughs) And all these like kind of pet food scandals that happened before this. So then you end up with this informed consumer. You know, this isn't like the random person that's not researching their products and just randomly picking this up, you know, in the grocery store. These are people that are researching to try and find these, you know, supposedly uh, premium products, you mm-hmm. know, that are human grade mm-hmm. that are not. <laughs> They're not. No, no. The actual, and, you know, one of the words, and I, I'm sure you've come across the word, too, is protein. Mm-hmm. I hate using that term protein because it was a life. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. it's like you have to use it in the politically correct term because it's, mm-hmm. it's in this sense. I always feel so guilty that the protein is tainted, but it's the that's the fact. And it always gets me. It's like, well, I don't, I'll ask this question to people all the time. Well, what do you think the protein is? Oh, it says right here, number one is beef. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. what part do you think it is? Or yeah. how? what was the well, condition? Well, you don't know. You no, know, right? you don't. There's like all these other uh, terms like we were talking about between feed and food. Yep. And then there's like meal. <laughs> yes. It's protein's like the generic, I guess, you know, but I mean, who the heck knows? But these are all different things to what, and this is where I guess from a legal standpoint, we look at what does a reasonable consumer think this is? You hey. know, like the industry can have like however they want to define it and, you know, all this other stuff, but what does a reasonable consumer think? <laughs> Here's here's what I understand this stuff. (laughs) This is what I used to always think, and this is before I became educated. And that was, I would see chicken, I would think human grade chicken. I'd see beef, Mm -hmm. I'd think human grade beef. Anything that I would be able to, they would Mm -hmm. be able to. Mm -hmm. Not something that was left over that you can't sell to human that they're going to just grind up. And I never thought about yeah roadkill. Yes, (laughs) animals that have died from disease. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, it's shocking. Just... I mean, can you imagine you're feeding your dog, let's just say skunk or or 
I don't know, just any kind of rodent that, that they found on the road, and it's all of a sudden mm-hmm. it's in your dog food with a nice right. little cute little red color on it. Yes, Why? Yes, absolutely. Shocking. It's, yes, yeah. it's, it's beyond, beyond, beyond belief. And, it, you know, again, I have zero knowledge of the law except for how not to break it. I know, I know how, how not <laughs> to break the law, and that's, that's my happiness. But I don't understand the law to, to so many degrees like you do. It has to be confusing at some point because here we got, we, here we got, that's terrible. <laughs> here we have property that has been mm-hmm. damaged. And, and we mm-hmm. were talking about this before we even started. The fact that this is now property that was damaged, not a life that was lost, not a family that was destroyed, property that was damaged. Mm-hmm. How difficult. I mean, one of the, yeah, one of the biggest, I would say, damages that's out there, though, with this stuff is vet bills. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I mean, you can say, you know, if your dog is a purebred, you know, golden retriever or something like that, like, there could be, like, a number that you put on the value of that. But that number isn't even going to equate to the amount that you pay in vet bills. Mm-hmm. And anyone who's ever had their, you know, pet go through some kind of surgery <laughs> like that understands what I'm saying. I mean, it's thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, in this case, and and that's where I was mentioning that it's different to my cases that I have involving human products because there you're talking about a price difference, you know, right. like, whereas here we're talking about that price difference because that's still part of the damage, but we're also talking about what happened because of that mm-hmm. misrepresentation, which is my dog got super sick and we spent, you know, $5,000 in vet bills to try to save them. You know, I mean, that's, that's the difference. Does emotional distress actually apply to this or because it's property, does it not, does it not apply? I'm, I'm never really yeah. understood. No, it doesn't apply, unfortunately. I mean, part of what makes some of our claims kind of more unique is that we're looking at fraud, essentially. Right. And when you're just looking like you were talking about like the property value, you know, you're damaged to your property by a certain amount. You're not talking about all this extra stuff, you know, with the vet bills and everything else, but that all comes like within fraud because it's like, well, I relied on this statement and because I did, this all happened to me. (laughs) So in a way that's, that's a good advantage to this where, you know, we can argue, you know, that they were, you know, participating in deceptive acts as far as, you know, what they were advertising and what product they had out there. Now, the next one was Petland. Mm-hmm. And you're you're doing that one as well. Um, mm-hmm. What is the actual story behind Petland and what actions are being taken? So the Petland case is very interesting. And there was actually a prior lawsuit that was brought uh, in, which we were talking about before, involving them misrepresenting their dogs as, you know, certain breeds and, you know, different things that were actually from puppy mills. Mm-hmm. And that case, unfortunately, uh, ended up getting dismissed. Um, but that was years ago. And so our case is actually different because what Petland has done, which is maybe also in response to a prior case, is that they provide a certificate of health at the time that you purchase your animal from them. And by the way, these animals are thousands of dollars. (laughs) You know, they're supposed to be whatever, you know, special breed they are. Um, And they provide this. It says, you know, it was vet checked, you know, before your purchase and it's healthy. You know, it doesn't have all these like, you know, different uh, diseases and stuff like that. And they also provide you with a warranty Hmm. with the pet when you buy it. And in that warranty, it says, you know, if certain things go wrong, you know, you can bring it to our vet, (laughs) which is a vet that they have a relationship with, who's obviously making money off of pet lands. Hmm. And it's also the one that's supposed to be certifying them as healthy. And they also direct you to this other company called Positive, which is supposed to be like a customer support. Um, you know, the first one you're supposed to contact if there anything goes wrong. And that's also, you know, sort of an agent of Petland that tries to prevent people from going to other vets and to find out what's going on with their pets and stuff like that. And 
really what their business is, is to sell you extra products, <laughs> you know, like different uh, welcome kits, you know, sign up for uh, puppy lessons, you know, <laughs> like all these different things. But they're all aimed at like trying to help the customer. And so our case, um, which is actually in Georgia, um, because that's where the kind of epicenter franchise is, um, this just outside of Atlanta, where they're training. So it's actually franchises, which is how Petland operates. So they have like their headquarters and then they have a bunch of franchises all over the country. And then they send people to get training at this place in Georgia because they're like the most profitable franchise. <laughs> and what happened with our client is she bought a dog and received this, you know, health warranty and like this, uh, you know, health check, you know, from a vet showing that they were certified as healthy. And less than 10 days later, the dog died. Wow. And in between that time, they had taken the uh, pet to the preferred vet, you know, which is affiliated with Petland, and he didn't treat the dog. He just gave him some antibiotics, and the dog didn't get better, and so they went to an actually independent vet, and that independent vet said, oh, this dog has parvo, mm -hmm. which is deadly, and, you know, it, it was the animal was not doing well at all, and so... When they found that out, they went back to the Petland vet and said, look, they said that this was Parvo. And so that vet started treating the, supposedly treating the animal. And days later, they found out through the Department of Agriculture, because the other the independent vet reported that the dog had Parvo because mm -hmm. it's like an infectious disease, that the animal had died. Mm -hmm. So the Petland vet didn't even tell them that their animal had passed away. Ouch. And yeah, yeah. And so it's a, also a very disturbing story. And it's actually a RICO case, which is a racketeering. You know, you might have heard it in relation to like the mafia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, So it's basically a conspiracy between all these different entities. You know, the uh, pet land headquarters, the franchise, the preferred vets. And this positive company, which is like the claims administrator, because one thing I didn't mention is that they also contacted this positive who sold them within the time that the their pet might have been dead, a, an additional welcome kit. <laughs> and they said, oh, this your uh, your dog's going to be released um, from the pet care, um, you know, within a few days and doing is your, uh, you know, your dog's doing great. And meanwhile, it was dead. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So it's clearly a conspiracy <laughs> under this racketeering um, claim that we have. You know, it sounds, it, at the beginning, I could relate to, to almost kind of before the lemon law came into effect, mm -hmm. where you would buy mm -hmm. a car, and it could be a POS. Yep. They didn't have to disclose anything. You'd yep. buy the car, it would break down. Oh, well, you could take it back to our, and someone would be even a big name dealership, bring it to our mechanic and we'll take a look at it. Oh, it's mm -hmm. fine. And they they were held with no responsibility. That's what mm -hmm. that sounded like. Very clear to me. And I'm going, wow. And yet we're treating it, it's a life, but we're treating it yep. like property. Oh my gosh. Well, and an interesting thing, too, uh, you mentioned lemon law. There's actually puppy lemon laws that have been passed across the United States. And Georgia is one of the few places that doesn't have one yet, which they're trying to. But <laughs> it hasn't passed yet. So that's part of the reason that we're able to bring this case. Because, unfortunately, even though the lemon law sounds like it would be positive for consumers, a lot of times the deadlines that you have, to actually like bring back your car or bring back your puppy, you know, whatever it is, you're out of luck. Wow. You know, so if the dog died in 11 days instead of 10 days, then there's nothing. There's no refund. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. They, they all play to that. Yeah, it's like, it's like, well, you didn't have the extended warranty, which would have covered an additional 10 days. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how sad is that? I mean, you, mm -hmm. It's, again, we're talking about a life here, and yet, yeah. You, it's just, it's almost not worth talking about. It's it's a piece of property. No. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I think with pet land, sometimes they try to say, oh, well, you can, you know, get a replacement. But yeah. who wants to go back and get a replacement after you've been through this? 
that, that's almost like saying we'll <laughs> give you store credit. It again. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's how they treat it. Wow. It's it's crazy. Like the stuff that we've uncovered with that is like really unbelievable. And of course, the other part of it is that it, you shouldn't even have to think about this warranty, you know, in those different, you know, conditions and everything, because it's supposed to be a healthy animal that was vet checked yeah. you know, before it was sold. <laughs> so so yeah, the, that's, the certificate's not worth anything. It's not even no, worth the paper it's no. printed on. It, that's, and the, they've already bought the pets at the time that they were vet checked, you know. So, I mean, there's no incentive to say, oh, this one's unhealthy. We can't sell it. And, so and it's, this falls underneath false advertisement, though, right? Well, so this one, like I mentioned, is actually under the racketeering statute. Because okay. it's a conspiracy, but it is, it's based on that. It's based on the misrepresentations, you know, that the health, you know, check, the vet check, um, is fraudulent, you know, yeah. like there's, and a lot of times they do it like right away and they know, you know, that these animals, you're not going to know if they even have parvo, you know, for another 10 days, but they try to sell them before it was <sighs> manifest. So, I mean, there's, yeah, it's a, it's a very, uh, sick industry. As yeah, as, <laughs> you know. it is, and that's what what always catches my attention is as I do this podcast each week, I'm I learn new things. Like like I'm learning so much right now. If you haven't, if you can't tell, I'm I'm just completely glued to my seat right now. Going, I didn't know that. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It <laughs> uh, it's 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 it is a weird industry that mm-hmm. you almost kind of go. It's not real. This can't be. Mm-hmm. We're talking about lives here, and yet, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yet, you could go to a big box store, and people are still buying all these products that are harmful. It's yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, it's 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 similar in that, like, obviously, these like vets that are making all their money off of pet land have no incentive. You know, like I said, to say, oh, you can't sell that because they want the continued business. Like, they get paid a monthly fee, you know, to vet check. Um, the animals. And then obviously Petland wants everyone to go to their preferred vet so that they can control the situation and under treat or misdiagnose, you know, so that they don't have to pay <laughs> to honor the warranties. So, yeah. I mean, it's the whole thing, you know, as far as like when you look at, you know, what we say in lawyer land is conflicts of interest. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately it's the same thing with the pet food industry where obviously the big players, you know, that are out there, the big pet food companies, they have no incentive to buy, you know, human grade meat, you know, that would be more expensive where they would lose their profit. You know? So meanwhile, they just take, you know, these meats that are not human grade, that are, you know, not from animals that die by slaughter and turn that into pet food and say, you know, it's this wonderful product, you know, and that we really care about your your dogs and your cats. <laughs> Please buy the food, you know, and falsely advertise it that way. Now, you've done a great deal of research. And so I'm. this is where I always kind of pick brains as well. Have you noticed the decrease in quality through big pet food over the last 10, 20, 30 years? Have you noticed it by doing the research? Because I've seen it. I'm like, wow, it decreased by a lot. It became the scientific blended BS in a bag. Now, opposed to actually having uh, what I would hope or what I saw was real meat and real good product at one point in time. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned before, I mean, the saddest part about this is that animals are dying. And the the shortcuts I think that these companies are making, whether it's because people are more informed and like are, you know, like I said, getting the word out, you know, about this stuff more or what, I don't know. Like if it's based on the products going downhill, yeah. you know, and that these companies just want to make more money and make more, you know, do more shortcuts for that. I mean, that that's a really sad result. Well, yeah. But, well, you know, like I said, I think there's also... Uh, increase in people if you look at you know the products they're buying that they want to buy these better products yeah. but that's not to say that what you said isn't true because the people that have or that try to sell these better products aren't necessarily selling a better product 
So it's it, it's almost like a catch twenty two. It almost actually is like it's polishing a turd. You know, that's yeah. what I always, that's exactly what I, I go down the pet food aisle. It's like, oh, I'm going to spend an additional $15 on a polished turd because that's all it yeah. is. Yeah. And I, I've had that argument with people. Now, with. But you, you don't think when you look at something that it's a lie. Right. You know? <laughs> and that's the most upsetting thing. Yes. <laughs> you think it's the truth because it should be. And that's what all these cases are about, you know, is that it's falsely advertised. <laughs> Well, you see the name of a product, and, you you know, I'm not even going to use the actual name, but there's, uh, right in St. Louis, a big company that you see their stuff everywhere, and they are mm-hmm. leading the way of bad food. Mm-hmm. And, and you're, you're seeing that 90% of dogs and cats are, are suffering from cancer, renal failure, obesity, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's just because dogs and cats are just not bred right anymore. That's such a weird way of, of, of analogy for, for what's going on. It's, mm-hmm. it's terrible. I mean, I get it. There are backyard breeders and, you know, in the Midwest, mm-hmm. we've got a lot of it. But. That's always been going on though. That's not new. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the only thing I, I can honestly say I think is different is that kids aren't feeding their dogs, you know, table scraps as much as they used to. That's, but that's actually a good thing. <laughs> well, yeah, well, no. Which is ironic. I wish that that was a bad thing. Yeah, we were taught it was a bad thing, but it was a good thing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. yet, yeah, that's one thing I can tell is different now. Even when you and I would have grown up, we would have thrown mm-hmm. our food down for the dog to eat and would be like, hey, you know, we're sharing with our dog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You don't see that now. It's no. no, no, no. It's biologically created food. Mm-hmm. Which I'm like, but that's not right. I mean, it, it's it's baffling. Yeah. Now, what do you think is in the line for big kibble in the future? Future lawsuits, more lawsuits, more awareness. Where do you see this going? Yeah, I mean, I think that in addition to um, what we were talking about as far as like consumers kind of rising up like a grassroots type movement, um, you know, voicing what they want, you know, and fighting against this, as well as, you know, only purchasing the products that we know are good, which is easier said than done, unfortunately. But I think one of the big advantages about bringing a class action is accountability. And not to bore you with the fight that's going on right now in Congress, but they're trying to limit the ability to bring class action. And I often, when I get into um, discussions with people about class actions, I bring up some of these cases and people are shocked, but there's no way that, you know, the mouths or anybody else would have been able to afford to hire an attorney to sue Avengers themselves. And they're, like I mentioned, their recovery is like, the cost of the food as well as the vet bills. And actually under Washington law, they provide for triple damages, um, which means triple the damages, right? So even that, but there's no way that an individual could have the kind of impact that you do when you bring a class action. And as we mentioned before, like you'd like to think that the government, you know, whether it's the Department of Agriculture, you know, in each state, or the FDA, whoever it is, is going to stand up to this. But the only people, in addition to the consumer advocates that are out there, that have a voice are the lobbyists, which are the pet food industry themselves, you know, that are influencing this stuff. So, you know, the FDA has limited resources. And unfortunately, you know, animals are at the bottom of the list compared to people. So, you know, that's what's so great about these types of cases is that we can get the story out there. You know, we can get out the facts of what happens. A court can decide, you know, who's right and who's wrong. It's not going to be, you know, whoever can spin the best story about this, you know, and hire the best PR firm and advertising that you don't know whether or not it's true. We can get this out there in the courts. (laughs) So I think that that's actually one of the best things. The thing that's tough about it is what we were saying, that the regulations don't always support yeah. bringing a false advertising case. And a lot of these big pet food companies are very savvy about how they advertise. 
And even though a lot of the, you know, people that are out there would go and buy this product would think it would mean, oh, this is a great product and everything. If you really start analyzing what it says, you realize it's a lot of what we call puffery. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, and, you know, like they say, the wolf instinct. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? And so it's not necessarily a material misrepresentation um, that would support a lawsuit. So it's tough. But I think the more that we get cases, which I hate to say like Avengers, but, you know, I would hate for people to have to go through what my clients have gone through. But that kind of thing and like testing this stuff is going to be the difference, I think, because you can't dispute dispute the truth. Right. You know, and that's what we have here. We have the truth. We have the testing. It's all there. The data is there. And that's what matters. Yeah. And that's why this case is different, you know, and there's going to be other cases like this. You know, it is sad that you have recalls that are out there and everything else, but sometimes that's the biggest way to expose it. So do you see in the future big pet food sitting in front of Congress as Big Tobacco did? (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) I like to. (laughs) It would be nice. Something's got to change, you know. I mean, there's it's it's incredible you know that this goes on you know and i think the more that people learn about it the more that people are going to become informed and they're going to rise up you know and make a difference and hopefully put this industry in check because i don't think it's going to come from the government themselves and it's certainly not going to come from the industry it's already self-regulated and this stuff is happening so (laughs) well you have lobbyists like pet food institute which mm-hmm. only members mm-hmm. that are there it's it's a membership by by recommendation in a sense they choose who's mm-hmm. who's on their board and and they don't have veterinarians and mm-hmm. they clearly even said right here on this podcast don't read the actual ingredients just mm-hmm. trust <laughs> i mean really clearly you would actually say that knowing that you're on this you know we're recording you're like don't even read the ingredients yeah wow um, yep. people like that. And then you mm-hmm. have AFCA, which of course we, we had a long discussion about you before we started recording. These people are polluting the industry. They're, they're actually telling them, Hey, go ahead, lower the standards. We'll be okay with mm-hmm. it. We'll just kind of network it through all the channels and it'll be allowed. They're mm-hmm. all guilty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I don't yeah, even... I mean, and that's where, like I was mentioning before, you know, we talk about conflicts of interest a lot, you know, in uh, our cases, you know, whether you're talking about a board of directors or, you know, a company or a lawmaker or whoever, but that's a huge conflict of interest. <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, if they don't have a consumer input that or one that they listen to, <laughs> then you don't have uh, unbiased um, results. Right. Gosh, And crazy. that's where we are with this stuff. But, you know, like I said, I think that the more people learn about this and start only buying those good products, like the rest of the pet food companies are going to be hurting. Yeah. And they're going to realize that if they want to sell anything, they're going to have to get their act together and sell better products. Well, they realize that their price point is what's actually doing it. It is more yeah. expensive to feed raw. It is more expensive to make your own. And they know mm-hmm. this, but they're mm-hmm. selling inferior products with chemicals that are killing dogs and cats. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's what you're buying, really. And I've heard it from everybody who's come on this podcast. It's the same thing from top to bottom. I killed my dog. I killed my cat. And it's like, you didn't know what you were doing. Yeah. You didn't know it. You know, you wouldn't have gone, done it. Right, right. Of course, of course. And, you know, I I always have to tell that to people, too. I mean, there's no way you could have known. Like, that's the fraud. You know, that's the fraud that they're putting out there. They're making it so you can't know. (laughs) You know, it's not not anybody's fault that they were deceived, you know, into buying that product. It's the company's fault that they're misrepresenting it to everyone. Yeah, and it's unfortunately continuing. But they have really pretty bags, really colorful, pretty bags. <laughs> don't so, fall for it. <laughs> don't fall for it. I love that. So let's move on to something that's actually really a lot more pleasant to talk about. 
Healthy Dog Expo, April 7th, 2018. You're going to be there, and you're going to be one of the speakers. Mm-hmm. Any idea, any kind of spoilers on things that you're going to talk about? Well, we'll see where we're at. You know, <laughs> as far as, like, the litigation goes, and, I mean, there might be more cases. Um, we're definitely investigating a lot of different things right now. Um, so, you know, I mean, maybe maybe we'll have some good results to share. <laughs> I told you I would not want to see you as the actual prosecuting or I, in your case, um, you're not the defendant. You'd be prosecuting. I don't know exactly. I don't know legal terms. I'm so glad I don't know legal terms, but I would want to know that you're the one that's actually putting the actual case together and, and representing because boy, you, you definitely have a voice that, uh, is gotta be intimidating, intimidating, intimidating in a courtroom. Well, I have. I have two little rescue dogs myself, so I think that makes a big difference that when you actually understand and care, (laughs) you know, what people are going through with this, you know, you can completely relate to it. That comes across, I think, you know, to the court, hopefully, (laughs) you know, and at least, you know, with our clients and everything, I think it makes it easier to represent them and to fight for them. Right. So what's next for you? Now, obviously you have your own firm, but you know what? I love how you're you're represented in is the the next rising star, which I told you even before, that's so offensive. You are already above and beyond and <laughs> and leading the way, leading the way when it comes to law. What is your next big adventure that you're looking to go on? Well, you know, like we were talking about, we're investigating Many other uh, companies, you know, that are having similar issues with their products. And, you know, I, I really wish that wasn't the case. But, you know, ever since um, this Avenger situation has cropped up, I think more and more people are realizing what a big problem this is. And they're trying to fight back and do something about it. So I think in the future, you're going to see a lot more cases that we're going to try to champion you know, for pet parents that are out there, you know, and fight back against all of this and hopefully change the industry. I I have a feeling that this is not the end. I I have a feeling that you are just barely beginning when it comes to not only fight, but put an actual voice for it. So that is just amazing. Um, I hope so. (laughs) Is there anything that we, have we missed anything? Is there anything that we really didn't cover? Well, one thing that I would say, and this kind of goes to what we were talking about with the regulators, um, and I put AFCO in that category, too, because they're basically creating the laws of pet food, even though they're not considered a government agency, which is a whole bundle of (laughs) things in itself, but uh, without getting into that. But the FDA, many years ago, actually studied pet food and found that pentobarbital was in it. (laughs) So, you know, the fact that this whole issue has kind of cropped up, it isn't, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody except that the FDA didn't do anything about it, you know, and it didn't really get out into the public, you know, the media didn't really talk about it. So, you know, (laughs) It's sad, you know, it could have been prevented, you know, and well, I mean, I would say it could be prevented, but honestly, I don't think they necessarily would have changed the law to prohibit these companies from putting that kind of meat into their foods. But, you know, wishful thinking, right? (laughs) Well, yeah. Well, here we go again. You know, you're you're thinking that the FDA is some kind of little fairy, tooth fairy type thing that's going to sneak into the house and make sure everything's nice and pretty and you'll wake up and everything's going to be in the right place. To find out that it really wasn't, you know, some nice little fairy tale character, but mm-hmm. a home invader. Right, um, right. And and that's, you know, I'm, I I really have nothing nice to say about the FDA, um, and I've I've made that one already multiple times clear. Um, I like to see them, you know, at least get their their stuff together, and and put a little bit more faith in that in that particular agency. It is a government well, one, run. One thing, yeah. One thing I think that. Uh, Anybody who's listening to your podcast, um, you know, there's a pet parent and suspects anything can do is report anything to the FDA. The FDA actually has set up like a whole uh, submissions, you know, of complaints 
And I'm not saying that I have no idea if they're following up on it, but I do know that they are reactionary <laughs> and not necessarily proactive. But if you put the information out there, at least it gives them a reason to look into it. Yeah, so the, anybody who thinks or suspects something, please report it. See something, say something. I yes, mean, definitely, exactly. definitely go down that way. Well, thank you, Jessica, for being on the podcast. I really, really appreciate you taking the time and, and kind of educating me because I'm, again, you're our first attorney that's ever been on, and I, I really enjoy talking to you. I did, too. Thank you so much for having me here, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Well, I'm Chris Green. Have a petastic week. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, gotta go in my bedtime.